Good morning. Uh, take a look at the screen to see what is happening in the next few weeks in the future. Uh, this week, welcome cable on Wednesday. Uh, it's a fun time, whether you just uh, participate through working or if you just want to come and dine. The office will be closed on Tuesday of this week. Uh, Jean Oldstrom is attending the conference. Are there any announcements from the floor? Julie? I have one. Um, with our new arrangement of chairs, Canadian was kind of people running into each other last time. So, <laughs> so what we're going to do is we're going to all come up this aisle and then go back that aisle. I thought we were going the other way. Oh, wait, uh, yes. <laughs> we changed it. We're going up that aisle and down this aisle. And Jill is there. So then hopefully we won't join. And I'll be back there helping everybody. So. And hopefully we don't have any crashes on the last slide. Mary has a suggestion that we all hold on to a knotted rope and come around. <laughs> 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 so and our offering plates are in the back of the sanctuary. You can or you can text the number on the screen to give your offering right now. Now please listen to our bells and our call us to worship. Good morning. with us, another great day to celebrate the, chat, the fact that we can be together to support one another, to challenge one another to be better followers of Jesus Christ in this place and beyond. And so I want you to take a deep breath because the Spirit of God is in this place. Breathe in that Spirit and then let's sing together. Lead a life 
which reflects your calling, that life of peace grounded in the spirit. Do you rejoice, rejoice in our oneness in Christ? Do you share the grace offered to us? Live a life worthy of the calling to which you have been called. We gather as God's family at the table prepared for us, waiting to be fed by the bread of life. And we pray. Gentle God, we have traveled through many waters to reach this place, but share one baptism. We arrive from different backgrounds and traditions, yet share one faith. We are each of us unique and precious to God and are members of one body. We have different dreams and doubts, yet our hearts beat with one hope. We are graced with different gifts, so we may offer them in service to one Lord. God in community, holy in one. Be with us this hour to better equip us for the work of ministry to a broken and hurting world. Amen.
Ten Commandments are so clear and clear-cut and black and white, right? No murdering, that's it. No murdering. Easy. Until when I was a child, the interpretation was not no murdering. I learned, thou shalt not kill. I learned, thou shalt not kill. Now, later interpretations say no. Accurately, it really says no murdering. But where is that line? Where is that line between what is killing? Is there just killing? According to Thich Nhat Hanh, they would say, I don't know that there is. We should be aiming for no killing at all. But where is that line? And more importantly, who gets to decide where that line is? This question has been haunting me since more than 50 years ago. When we were first trying to pass Roe v. Wade. And I started to notice that the most vehement voices against Roe v. Wade were the people who were marching every year with their military honors and almost celebrating war. And I thought, what, isn't there a huge contradiction in this? And then I realized they were the same, the same thing about those of us who were for Roe v. Wade. How can you be against the war in Vietnam and for abortion? Which is the way it's been interpreted, not about choice, not about, back then it was just right. But who gets to decide which is murder? Lately, I've been thinking about the situation in the Middle East and how separated we are over that. How many different opinions there are about who's right and who's wrong. And I sit back and I think, absolutely, the bombing was horrible, the bombing by Hamas. And then I think about a friend who lived in Palestine for a year, a friend who taught me about the slow erosion, the, the restrictions against the Palestinian people that have caused such desperate situations. Uh, it, we were just at an event uh, this week uh, Thursday night, Kirk was there as well. Um, Jen from Good Courage Farms has done some research on the shrinking of Palestinian rights in that region of the Palestinian region and how. <coughs> oh, I can't give you the whole history. I can't give you the whole history. But how those people who live there have been occupied and occupied and occupied and occupied. Um, going back to the Ottoman Empire before that, if you look in the Bible, it's there, right? This is, this is the land that the Israelites said, oh, there's some land, oh yeah, there are people there, but God said we can have that land, right? So, In the minds of Hamas, was that October bombing murder, or was that October bombing a declaration of war, and is war justified? I can't know the mind of Hamas. Is Israel's response murder? Or is it justified defense of their country and land? Who gets to decide? In the meantime, in both cases, the innocent who have no choice in it whatsoever are the people who's, who are giving their lives.
so let's talk euthanasia. I said, I, I was talking to a friend last night who was, and I said what my topic was for today's sermon, and she, she immediately went to euthanasia. Is euthanasia murder? Yes? No? If a person knows that they are at the end of their life, if their prognosis is six months of pain, is it murder to allow them to let go without before that six months of pain happens. A certain document I've been reading says absolutely it's murder. You cannot euthanasia, there's no place for euthanasia in our nation. But the compassionate part of me that has watched people slowly go through the pain of death says I'm not so convinced. Where is the line and who gets to decide? The other two readings I chose today kind of get to before you even get there, right? Before you even get there, can we turn down the temperature that leads us to justify murder? Can we turn down the temperature in our own selves so that our first knee-jerk reaction when somebody makes us mad isn't to want to hurt that person? And if enough of us turn down the temperature in our own hearts and our own souls, then could we spread that energy to the whole world? Could we turn it on the temperature globally? Could we start with negotiation instead of waiting until war has been raging for months and months and months and then say, gee, maybe we should negotiate this instead? Could we? I don't know where even to go with the rest of this, right? What else do I say? Jesus said, turn down the temperature in your own head, in your own mind. No murdering is not so easy, but it's not just about the physical act of killing. It's about hating. It's about letting yourself get so angry that you want to hurt someone. It's about finding peace within yourself. Can we do that? How can we do that? And how can we as followers of Christ spread that message? What do you think? Is there a thou shalt not kill, don't murder, that has haunted you for forever? of a spider in your bathroom. <laughs> right? Take not on included the spider in your bathroom. Do you kill it or not? Right? Or do you just kind of back up and hope it doesn't drop on you while we're in the shower?
this is one of the foremost reasons why I come here. Because a sermon like this provokes me to think and question. And as far as euthanasia goes, you know, we, a lot of us have had pets that we've had to do that with, and we, we think that we're doing a good thing. Um, you know, I've got a health care directive, and I don't know how clearly defined it is on how long I want to be kept alive, but I don't want to suffer either. But then who do I put in charge of that health care directive, you know? If my brother's in charge of it, is he going to remember the time I beat him up when he was 12 years old? <laughs> I remember when I was younger, I had a lot more fire in me about doing something about things that were unjust and wanting to hurt somebody for being unjust. Whereas now, I am a little more tolerant of different points of view and what's just and what is unjust isn't as clear as what I thought it was. And uh, so, you know, so I just hope that. Uh, that as I, I don't know what it is about when I've grown older. I hope, maybe I, I hope it's because I've become wiser. That's all I can say. There's scripture that says that God is compassionate, God is merciful. So, what is the compassionate, merciful way?
pro one side or the other. But I keep hearing people say Hamas is evil if we don't wipe them out. This is just going to continue forever and forever and forever. But the human response to watching your family be blown away, that first response is not going to be compassion for your enemies. And so how much, how much violence continues until there's just no going back? Because what comes after Hamas, it seems to me, is going to be even more violent, even more angry. What comes after Netanyahu will be even more angry and more violent. And it just escalates more and more and more. And to your point, yes. I haven't in my lifetime seen violence lead to peace. Not in my lifetime. Not when I read world history have I seen violence lead to peace. But then we go back to what's murder and who gets to decide. It's bigger than any of us can decide. However, if we don't ever stop to think of it, we just go through life on Facebook memes, right? Reacting. Reacting big. I'm right, you're wrong, and we need to stop doing that. So. May we all find a place of peace within us, a place where we find compassion for somebody who maybe has had so much violence in their own world that it's the only thing they know. And maybe if we understand that, we can step back when we are hurt and respond with compassion, as Jesus calls, calls us to do, as Tignat Han calls us to do as all of the great spiritual leaders called us to do. Amen.
the soul to sing. It really does. So let's try it again. We'll go from the beginning. Holy One, we thank you that you are with us in this place, lifting us, encouraging us, sometimes pushing us along to do what we were called to do. And at the same time, surrounding us, enveloping us like a loving hug when we just cannot seem to go on, comforting us, holding us, giving us hope in the midst of conflict, in the midst of terminal illness, in the midst of mental illness and challenges. I'm wondering if there are prayers 
to be lifted from the congregation today. You know the prayers that we hold in the depth of our being, O oh God, and so hear us now as we simply pray, Creator of all that is, hallowed be thy name, thy, thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Forgive us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our debts, as we forgive our debts.
gathered as God's people, may we scatter to bring grace to all. Having gathered as the body of Christ, may we scatter to share justice for everyone. Having gathered in the presence of the Spirit, may we scatter to be healers of our world. Would you stand and let's sing together, lead us from death to life.